well. Welcome to Ascension. Glad to have you all with us this evening. And if you haven't noticed, for the next 40 days, we're going to be living a life on mission here. 40 days. You know, that's a nice biblical number, isn't it? 40 days is short enough so that it'd be fun, but not too long so it becomes tedious and boring. You know, the whole staff in the, in the office have been involved with this, with designing t-shirts and posters and getting our commission of education there with the small groups and the Sunday school. And so a lot of people have been involved as we start out this series, Life on Mission. But to start off, I want to ask three questions, really. Do you ever wonder what you're here for? Do you wonder what your mission is? Don't you think we ought to figure it out? Just a couple weeks ago, I became a grandpa for the second time. And you know how weird that is? I mean, I just don't feel old enough to be a grandpa yet. You grandpas know what I'm talking about here. But the older I get, the faster time seems to go by. It almost reminds me of that Billy Crystal rant that he goes on in Slitty Slickers right at the beginning, you know. He's kind of depressed and in the classroom, and he goes, you young people enjoy the stage of life. He said, you've got all kinds of choices. You can do any, you think you can do anything you want. In your 20s, when you're 20s there, it just goes by like a blur. When you turn 30, then you have a family, and you start having kids. Kids and you wonder what happened to your 20s. When you get into your 40s, then you grow a pot belly and you get a double chin and you start complaining about how loud the music is and the girlfriend you have in high school becomes a grandma. And then by your 50s, you have the surgery. Oh, they might call it a procedure, but it's really surgery. By the time you hit your 60s, you have major surgery, and you still, could, you still think the music is too loud, but by that time, you don't care because you can't hear it anymore. By your 70s, you retire and move to Florida, and you start eating dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning and breakfast the evening before, and you spend all day running around the mall looking for the ultimate soft-serve yogurt and wonder why your kids don't call you. And then when you turn 80, you have a major stroke and you end up babbling to your uh, Jamaican nurse there that your wife hates because you call her mama. Yeah, it goes by that fast, doesn't it? It's really amazing. So, what am I supposed to do while I'm here? What is my mission? If God didn't have a purpose for you being here, he would have taken you to heaven the minute you became a Christian. Because that way there wouldn't be any backsliding or losing a faith. Think about that. The reason you're here is because God has a purpose for you. You know, there are two things that you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. You can pray in heaven. You can sing in heaven. You can worship in heaven. But you can't sin. And you can't tell people about Jesus. Because everyone will know Jesus when you're in heaven. So why do you think God has you here on earth? To sin? Of course not. You're here to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the only reason that your heart is still beating in you after you become a believer. Because you've got a mission. Now, when I say the word mission, some of you might start, uh, minds might start wandering back to the ultimate soft serve yogurt because, I know, I know, mission just sounds like work, doesn't it? It sounds like, uh, it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, you know. Am I going to have to go to the airport in a robe and hand out tracts? Or am I going to have to go and knock on doors and ask people, hey, if you die tonight, will you go to heaven? No, please, put that out of your mind. Because if you do the things that God wants you to do in the way that God wants you to do them, life becomes so fulfilling, full of meaning. So over the next six weeks, there are a few things that I want you to know about and do. First of all, 
Make a commitment to be here the next six weeks. Be in worship. There are five action steps that we're going to talk about of how to do mission in our daily lives. This tonight's the why of mission. In the next five, talks about the how of mission. And they're kind of in an order, so make a commitment to be here each week. Number two, Either attend a Sunday school or Pastor Girdle's Wednesday night Bible class that he has talking about how other people have implemented these five steps of life on mission. Seeing how other people can have done it may spark, say, hey, that's, maybe that's what God's calling me to do. See, that way we help each other. Number three, join or start a small group. There's a part in that workbook that's for sale out there for just a mere $10. There's a part in there for, a, for small groups to get together and talk about these five steps as well. You don't have to have, um, you know, not people that you don't know. Maybe there's a group at work and you can walk up to them and say, you know, our church is doing this mission thing. Why don't you come and join me on this mission thing for the next 40 days? Just for 40 days. That's all I'm asking for you. Start a small group if you don't belong to one right now. And number four, involve your family. At the very end from the small group, there are five devotions that are very quick devotions that you can share to get your whole family involved, one each week. You can do it at dinner time or at Chick-fil-A when you're coming back from soccer practice or on your way to school if you take your kids to school or anytime, you know, at bedtime. They're very short, but they're very good. You know, I just read a recent study that said that the most well-adjusted children in society are those who eat supper together. Those who eat supper together. Use that opportunity to build up one another because I truly believe that we can wrap our arms around this mission thing that it can transform you and transform our church. But before you donate your body to the ground, wouldn't it be good to discover what your mission is? What is it? Here's what St. Paul says. The most important thing in my life is that I complete my mission. What is it? What is the work the Lord Jesus gave me to do? Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. That's the mission. That's your mission. That's our mission. Are you sure that's our mission? Yep, because Jesus said it. He said, he said to us there, you will be my witnesses, that's our epistle lesson, in Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You are witnesses. Witnesses. You're not God's prosecuting attorneys. You're not God's judge. You're not called to be a defense attorney. You are called to be a witness. That's all you are to do. To the ends of the earth, let's see. Ascension is involved in ministries in Tanzania. We've got ministries that we're involved in in uh, Brazil that we do. We've got the Heinies in Guinea, West Africa. Oh, we've got a missionary in India, Christina Devaney Nelson now. She just got married. You know, so I think we got the ends of the earth covered. We're in partnership with Passageways, uh, homeless veterans here. We've got a homestead, a nursing home that we provide devotions for. Uh, We help out with Gently Use, the Bethesda home uh, store here in Wichita. We've got Open Arms and Tyler Preschool as ministries to our community. We started a new campus in Pratt. I think we've got Judea and Samaria covered. But don't forget about Jerusalem. The home, because that's where mission starts. Jesus said that the most important thing in the world, two commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbors as yourself. Love dad and love his kids. Oh, and by the way, his kids live 
next door. They're all around us. Do you know that the United States is one of the largest mission fields in the world right now? It's like third or fourth largest. You know, we used to send missionaries out into the world. Now missionaries are coming back into the United States. China, Christianity is growing like crazy in China, even though it's being persecuted. On the continent of Africa, it is exploding. I mean, in that Tanzania trip we went this summer, 836 souls in six days we added to God's kingdom there. Asia, it's growing like crazy. It's growing like crazy everywhere except here in the United States. We're in one of the largest mission fields in the world, but we don't act like it. I read a lot of church books and... um, Yeah, that's good. But I also read some business books because I want to know what it takes to be a a good leader as well. One of the authors that I've read was called, his name was Peter Drucker. I think maybe you've heard about him. Someone asked Peter Drucker about, um, you know, what is the key ingredient to having a successful business? And Peter's answer was kind of simple and yet succinct so that you remember it. Peter said that the first business of any business is to know what business you are in. So what business are we in? Well, some people might say, yeah, I kind of don't like that, Pastor, because, you know, we're a church. We're not a business. Hey, glad you noticed. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, if we want to change it into church lingo, what is the mission that God has given his church, his people? We said it. We're in the witness business. That's what business we're in. So how's business? The book Life on Mission, that's written by the same guy who did our workbook out here, it begins this way. Your mission if you choose to accept it, which is a classic line from the old TV series, Mission Impossible. Yeah, I mean, even Tom Cruise in the remakes used that line, your mission, if you choose to accept it. And then a tape recorder tells the tasks that at hand and and then self-destructs from that. And the agent then goes on that mission. No one else heard what the task was, No one else knew it but just that agent. Nobody else could do it. You know what I never saw happen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. What I never saw happen on that show, Mission Impossible, is the agent saying, you know, I'm not feeling it today. I think I'm just going to go get a roast beef sandwich and uh, call it in for the day. Never saw that happen. If you're an agent... You take the mission. That's what you do. If you want a government job where you don't have to do anything, just go apply at the DMV or some other place that I can uh, lead you to. Jesus says that our mission is his mission, to seek and to save the lost. I don't know if any of you have your Bibles with you or you can just open... Uh, Well, you don't. Some of you don't. Um, Chapter 15, the gospel lesson read for today. What were the Pharisees and the Sadducees complaining to Jesus about? Remember that? What were they complaining about Jesus? That he was eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. They were complaining that the doctor was tending to people who were sick. And Jesus then, in his very um, Jesus-like way, God way, doesn't answer them directly. He tells three stories, three parables. Remember what the parables he told were? The first one was the parable of lost sheep. Ninety-nine of them left out in the field so that he could go after that one lost sheep. And the second one was the parable of the lost coin, in which she had ten coins, She still had nine of them, but she swept her whole house to find that one lost coin. And then he tells a third parable, the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. 
And in that parable, he talks about how the son went off, took dad's inheritance, went off, squandered it, and came back home when he ran out of money. But then after those three short stories, we come to the punchline. You might not have read it that way before. The punchline is the first word of verse 25 in the NIV. Does anybody remember what that word is? Meanwhile. Meanwhile. It's not a good word. You know, if things are going well and you come across the word meanwhile, Ah, something is going on that's not going to be good. I sort of imagine some of those old uh, cartoons, you know. Meanwhile, Batman, while he is being lowered into a vat of poison, or meanwhile, you know, the Rocky and Bullwinker narrator, you know, meanwhile, the damsel, while it's tied to a railroad track, you know. Meanwhile just isn't a good word, and yet that's what Jesus said. Meanwhile, the older brother became angry and refused to go into the party. I mean, who does the older brother represent? Church-going people. That's who the older brother represents. The father went out and pleaded with him to come in. It's like, how can you not celebrate? Your brother was lost, and now he's home. He's alive. Except when you realize that this is the punchline to those three stories, to the people who were complaining that Jesus was spending all his time with tax collectors and sinners. You know, the older brother says, hey, look, all these years I've slaved for you and I've never done anything wrong and you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends and here you're this son of yours when he comes back after wasting all your property on prostitutes, it almost sounds like he's jealous there, he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. There it is, folks. There it is. This son of yours according to the older brother, doesn't belong in the father's house. Doesn't belong there. He's not good enough anymore. I'm here because I'm good. Oh, sure, yeah, I have a few sins. You know, I may be envious of my neighbor's new truck. I may have a few credit cards that are maxed out, but I'm basically good. There's no way that I should have to give up my parking spot for a guest. There's no way I should give up my, part, my spot in the pew for a, a visitor that morning. And there's certainly no way I should give up my time and my talents or the fattened calf for the lost. You see, Jesus' point here that he was trying to make is that the older brother should have had his younger brother in mind, love for him in mind. He should have had the attitude, the same attitude as dad. Kill the cow, find a rope, put a ring on his finger. Bend over backwards to make sure this son gets home and stays home because the father loves the child. The father loves his children. The father loves his kids. Here's the way Jesus said it. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Why? Because that's the mission. That's our mission. That's how God the Father feels about his kids, our neighbors. That's how God feels about you and your family, your friends, your co-workers. That's our mission, our business, if you will. 
That's what we're called to do as a church, to share the Father's love that in his one and only Son he sent to take away our sins so that we can, everyone can, come home and live with the Father forever. So how is that done? Over the next five weeks, Pastor Girdle and I will be unpacking the nuts and bolts of these five action steps, and it's way simpler than you think. For the Christian, life is mission. We're always on mission. That's why you're not dead yet. So make a commitment. Make a commitment to live Life on mission. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.